Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, all of you who have joined our session here today. We are going to be discussing equity in the context of preprints with a great uh, set of three panelists. Um, Humberto Debat from the Instituto Nacional de Tecnología Agropecuaria in Argentina. Yoyo Wango from uh, TCC Africa, and she's also a member of the advisory board for Africa Archive, and Jeroen Bosman from Utrecht University Library in the Netherlands. Um, we had a few activities to run for you through the chat, but the chat has been di disabled. Um, however, my awesome uh, colleague, Jessica Polka, who is also um, uh, on this call and has like the most fantastic virtual background you could ever imagine, <laughs> uh, has the details there because she's going to be posting uh, some questions that we had for you on the Slack. So please check the details there. Uh, have a look, uh, I guess, you know, try to, to, as best you can, coordinate between Zoom and Slack. But we're going to be posting some questions, again, to have a sense as to who is here with us today and hopefully yeah. to get some, um, some bits that will feed the conversation later. If you have any questions at any point, uh, what we were planning to do is to listen to the presentations of our three speakers and then open for questions. We wanted to have a little bit of interaction with all of you. Uh, as we do not have the Slack, uh, please again post any questions on the Slack and we will either uh, read them for you, or if you are very interested in saying, uh, in essentially sharing that verbally with us, we, we will attempt to unmute you. Um, oh, something else I wanted to mention is that uh, all of the presentations will be in English, uh, but if you are more comfortable posting anything on Slack in either Spanish or French, I can attempt to translate those questions for the panelists into English, so essentially feel free to also post in those languages if you prefer. Okay, so having covered the housekeeping, um, let's talk about equity and preprints. Um, so uh, to, to give a little bit of introduction into the topic, um, for all of us who have been uh, following uh, preprints in the life sciences uh, over the recent years, we were very encouraged by the adoption, obviously. And we believe that preprints bring a, a lot of benefits to science communication, obviously the speed of, of uh, sharing and communication, the possibility for feedback, but also as it was discussed in this paper, the potential to democratize the flow of information. Preprints are free to post, are free to access. So in principle, anyone can participate and post preprints, read preprints, etc. However, what we see when we look into the trends that have been surfacing over recent years is that there are a number of disparities in terms of uh, the submissions of preprints and who is engaging uh, with the papers posted in the preprint servers. There are disparities related to the geographical region, countries, we see that some countries have proportionately more representation in terms of preprinting, even when we normalize by the um, research output that you would expect from that specific country. There are also disparities in terms of gender for the authors submitting preprints. Again, this can vary per discipline, but there has been a real impact, for example, this year in the clinical sciences in terms of a drop of female uh, scientists posting preprints in MedArchive. And there are also um, certain challenges related to language. We know that English is the lingua franca for scientific communication, but the reality of things is that we have many, many scientists who come from countries where English is not the first language. And what they do is they operate on their day-to-day -day activities in another language, and then they have to switch to English to write their papers, which can sometimes present some challenges. In addition to all of this, what we also see is some disparities in, the, in discoverability of, of preprints. And by this, what I, what I mean is that they, the, when you're looking for uh, the latest literature, um, not all the tools actually index preprints, uh, along with journal articles or other outputs, for example. And even when they do, there can be very different uh, representation uh, depending on the tool that you use. This is an example comparing the same search for research square preprints into different tools. Uh, Lens.org will give us about 70,000 preprints while Google Scholar will give us three. I think we can agree that the, there is a certain disparity here and some work to be done in terms of indexing and discoverability. Mm. So we thought that we uh, would come up, essentially have this conversation here about, about these issues. 
Um, also, because we, I, I personally agree very much with what Oya Rieger uh, discusses in this in this paper. One of the conclusions is she very clearly uh, outlines how the, it will be critical for the future of preprints um, in the life science, but also generally to make sure that we bring all of the different communities with our, again, from different countries, different regions, different languages, etc. So we're hoping to open this conversation here, uh, learn a little bit about certain uh, initiatives uh, that have been taking place in this space, and then have a conversation where, with, with our three fantastic panelists. So without uh, further ado, I will hand over to Umberto Debat, who is going to tell us a little bit about uh, his work in this space. Umberto, would you like to share your own slides? Okay, thank you. Um, let me check. Um, Oh, well, I hope you are able to see the slides. It's loaded. Yes. Okay, great, great. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Iraxe, for the invitation. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, I have been experiencing several internet connection problems today, uh, which made me think a lot about that in terms of bringing equity also, because as you well know, even though in the USA, around 90% of the population or in Europe are, have internet access, in Latin America, it's around 72%, but it ranges a lot. For instance, in, in Nicaragua or Honduras, it's around 30%. So, so that's another half tackles also in, in scholar communications that we take for granted sometimes. So, well, I, I try to go as fast as I can, and I'm going to speak mostly about language and preprints. Um, so, aquí informamos de identificación y caracterización de un nuevo coronavirus que causó una epidemia de síndrome respiratorio agudo en humanos en Wuhan, China. La epidemia que comenzó el 12 de diciembre de 2019 causó 198 infecciones confirmadas por laboratorio, con tres casos fatales antes del 20 de enero de 2020. Okay, so you may have uh, experienced uh, the feeling that most of the population from the globe has when somebody is speaking in a language that they are not able to understand, read or speak. So to, to put that in perspective, that was the, uh, what I just read was just a little part of the preprint, which was one of the first one about this uh, new uh, pandemic virus, which was presented in the first days of January. And, 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 and what I read was an automatic translation to Spanish of that prepping, which was very pretty fair. To put, put uh, the language issue in perspective, around 5% of the global population speaks English as a native language. Around between 10 and 15% are able to speak or read in English. Uh, even though uh, around 6.3 billion people in the world are able to read, Around more than 5 billion people are not able to read English. Uh, so well, that, that, that would be the focus of my talk, uh, that, uh, that uh, the majority of people in this planet is not able to read in English, uh, for instance. So um, I'm, uh, a little catch up about preprints. Uh, my colleague and friend, Sarvena Sarabipu, led a, a beautiful paper about the uh, early career research perspective about preprints. I, I, I love them and I advocate the use of, of, of these as a means to, to accelerate uh, the dissemination of knowledge, gain visibility and impact, um, and also as a way to, a, a more inclusive way to participate in scientific uh, communications. Um, there, this year, we have experienced uh, something, uh, a radical paradigm shift in, in the generation of new discoveries in science. This, there is no parallel of what happened this year, and it has a lot to do not only uh, by the amount of information, but also the speed it was communicated. To put that in a, a little bit in perspective, uh, for instance, when there was the first uh, uh, outbreak of SARS, which was in 2002 or 2003, uh, the, 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 the publication of the complete genome of, of that virus happened a month after the PME started, almost seven months, and in this case it was 10 days after uh, the first communication of symptomatic cases. It also, well, uh, or for instance, 
93% uh, of all the literature regarding this uh, outbreak in 2003 was published after the outbreak is, uh, ended. Um, as, as you can see in the left panel, uh, even this, uh, this uh, preprint from Daniel Torres Salinas, it, it was a forecast about the generation of new knowledge uh, in the context of COVID-19, which was exponential, it, it still is. Um, and, and what happened before this new outbreak, for instance, in the right panel and the low, you see uh, an article from Mark Lifted and his team about preprints being an underutilizing mechanism to accelerate outbreak science. That was in 20, uh, 2018. And, and they talk about how uh, in the Zika and Ebola outbreaks uh, in 2015 and 2017, uh, the, the, there was a lot of analysis and results that were available a hundred years before being published in, uh, in journal articles, but we are available already in preprints. Um, so, so um, let me check. I think, uh, so, uh, and only about five percent of the articles regarding these two outbreaks were preprinted. So, so you you can see that that changed a lot uh, in these times. So here in this new image that appear, it's, it's, it's from uh, Bianca Kramer and Nicholas Fraser. They integrate all the COVID uh, uh, preprints that are being uh, posted. And uh, this, this image is a little old, but now they are reaching about 30, 35,000 preprints published. But if you can see most of them be uh, basically uh, if you read which are the research, the source, I mean the, the repository, you can see that all, 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 almost all of them are, are posted in English. So, so the, the, the picture here, the path, uh, Ivan Oransky, who is uh, the, the lead of Retraction Watch, and in that uh, uh, he has been quoted by saying something that is probably very old, but it but it really marked me when I read it. Uh, that that is that science is a conversation. So so in uh, using that as a fundamental basis of, of science, you can see a lot of stuff that happens around when language is concerned, uh, because we're talking about the conversation and people talk in different languages. So there are a lot of things that are affecting the way that, uh, that, that we share information and that we have the opportunity for, to participate or not in this conversation. There are many articles here posted, uh, many of them you know, uh, wondering about uh, science beyond English. I'm going to talk a little bit about that after. Uh, and also, uh, as, as Sirac mentioned, that English is the lingua franca in, in most international publishing. Um, and there have been some uh, initiatives, a, a lot, about uh, who have tried to deal with this issue. One of them, for instance, is the Helsinki Initiative of Multilingualism to, to try to promote the generation of, of, of scientific uh, scholar articles in several uh, languages to try to provide more opportunity to share things, not only at the regional level, but globally. And, uh, uh, or for instance, at the right lower panel, there, there is an initiative known as COVID Translate. We try to uh, gather uh, crowdsource a lot of people to try to translate uh, many, uh, m a lot of information from Korea about COVID in the first days of the pandemic. They were like one of the first country that uh, the new, that the generated a lot, gathered a lot of information and tried to generate uh, documents in English to, to share with the, with the global community. So these two articles are, are, are very important in, in my opinion regarding that science is a conversation, uh, which we describe this one from, from Amano, which describes that, that there is a need for the multilingualization of new and existing knowledge available only in English for users of such knowledge. And in the right panel, this correspondent from a colleague uh, uh, from Uruguay who, who, who pointed out the, the possibility of generating community uh, comprehensive multilanguage translation tool with the help of service such as Google Translate to try to broaden the, 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 the access and, and the democratization of, of knowledge. In, 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 in the context of these two publications, uh, uh, we 
we, we came up with the idea of generating the tool to try to help a little bit uh, regarding this, this problematics. And it was based in, in two premises that it, they could be false, but it's, it's, it's a personal opinion that says that uh, in, in, in non-scientific literature, uh, translation is, is judged or guided by aesthetics. There are a lot of resources that are very important and must be respected and interpreted to try to generate very good translations of documents. Uh, on the other hand, we believe that the central or crucial aspect of translated scientific literature is legibility, that you are able to understand the essence of a document if the, uh, it's sometimes fair enough to get, the, to get that information flowing. So uh, that's how it, uh, it emerges, uh, the, this tool called Panlingua based in, in, in a phrase or an, a language that was invented by, the, by this, uh, uh, this multi-tasking people uh, called uh, Sul Solar, uh, uh, who, who managed to create uh, this language, he says, that, that to try to help people know each other. It's like a, a, a universal language, like the Esperanzo. So, uh, well, eventually we, uh, I, I, I give uh, in, a, in a, I was very lucky to be in a, in a, in a meeting, in a workshop where I presented this, uh, this idea, like, you know, like something that I will say that it could be very useful. And in the audience, there was Rich Abdil, which is in the photograph at the right panel. And, and after I made that presentation, he came to me and he said, I think I can help bringing up this idea uh, uh, for you. Uh, and, and, and eventually, uh, at the other day, he, he has like a, a draft version already working. So, so that, uh, I mean, I was very lucky to be in contact with somebody who has the ability to do things that I, I that I'm not able to do, and to try to bridge these this this uh, this very difficult situations in where you, you think that you can provide something, but you're not not able to do. That's that, that has to do a lot of of dialogue and sharing and, and and talking. And and it was because I was privileged enough to be able to speak in English and to be in a meeting with him. So well, uh, I'm very thankful for Rich. That so those are the contact information. Also, Irak mentioned in a paper before about the the different use of preference in 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 the world and adoption, and it was led also by Rich Hadbill. So eventually, uh, this uh, very uh, small tool uh, makes you be able to try to search and discover all the knowledge available in bioarchives in your own language by just using Google Translate. It's, it's very simple, but, but we think that it might be useful for a lot of people. Um, and of course, what happens when you get the, this very simple tool is that you think about the, 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 the very, the, the very of, uh, uh, evidence, uh, counterintuitive um, other tool that is in the need for, which is a tool which is able to translate all the non-English literature, uh, scientific literature available in, in the world, which is uh, of, of such magnitude that we, uh, and we it's, it's almost like uh, undiscoverable for, for most of the, of, of, of the world, even when we talk about south to south uh, communications. For instance, here is mentioning that about 80 million uh, articles are written in Chinese and only in that language. And, 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 and one of them, for instance, is the landmark study by UU2 who, who, who discovered the artemisine, a, a, com a compound that saved millions of lives from malaria, uh, from Chinese medical medicine. Uh, well, she earned the Nobel Prize in 2015, but the articles is writing in Chinese and it has not even been cited uh, almost a few times because it's not like available, etc. So uh, there are, for instance, also like a million and a half articles writing in, in, in Portuguese, in La Referencia, or many, many databases with a lot of scientific information, which is, which if we don't have like this kind of resource, it's, it's, it's very difficult to discover. I dream like in, in, in a future where we will have like some kind of, 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 of uh, overlay uh, ecosystems where anybody will see in their own language, all the information available in scientific articles. And that will be like the start of the new way to, to being able to have science like a real conversation. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Umberto, and also for finishing such a, uh, with such, a, such an interesting vision. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, right, so next up, we have Jojo Wango from TCC Africa and Africa Archive. Um, Joy, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Super. I hope you're able to see the slides. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so what I'm going to take you through is more or less similar to what uh, Umberto was actually emphasizing on, on, on how, you, how we need to increase our language diversity, especially when it comes to the visibility of outputs per region. And uh, I'll talk about how Africa Archive and TCC Africa is, is trying to build equity, especially in the preprint ecosystem and the tools we are trying, we are using to support that whole process. So uh, I'm the founder of TCC Africa and it's a center that supports researchers, research institutes and governments in Sub-Saharan Africa on how to improve their research visibility and output and also encouraging them on how to use open science to also support those their higher education ecosystems. And we are the founding project partner for Africa Archive. So Africa Archive was set up in uh, 2018 and it is the first and it's actually the only Pan-African cross-disciplinary preprint platform in the continent. So it is for African researchers or anyone doing research on and about Africa. So far we have over 370 submissions and what we are trying, we are inviting submissions in African languages and we are fostering preprint based peer review. This is also in collaboration with our partners. And we've been doing quite a bit of networking and capacity building across the digital science, science communication workflows in Africa. So now when you look at what we are trying to do as, as, as Africa Archive is increase the visibility of research output coming out of the continent. That is one of the ways we are trying to build that equity, which has always been a challenge because it would be either only in the main research interest areas of the continent, that is climate change, um, agriculture or health sciences, but yet there's so much still coming out of the continent. So, and also it would be maybe society based. So all the other researchers who are not, who do not belong to some of the major societies, you not easily see their research output as those in those societies. So as such, what Africa Archive has effectively done, it has literally leveled the plane so that anyone in the continent, all 54 countries has a platform to share their research output, their data, and in collaboration with our partners, Zenodo, PubPub, Figshare, Science Open, and OSF, it gives it a global reach. So we are seeing a situation where people, people, uh, Africa, African early career researchers in Africa, their outputs are being seen quite early. We are seeing citations, we are seeing downloads, we are seeing even easier ways for them to get their work published. So it is quite, it's quite uh, a, a game changer in, in, in the African continent, especially when it comes to academic publishing and the research visibility of the output coming out of the continent. Because at the end of the day, since we all fall under the umbrella of open science, with what we've successfully done with Africa Archive is that the preprints uh, have led to a global knowledge exchange in the, in the growth of quality education coming out of the continent. There's been a lot of critique about the quality of education coming out of the continent, especially in higher education, but you, we need to understand some of the factors that lead to some of the, to the poor education is lack of systems, supporting systems in the higher education sector. And some of these uh, support systems in, are, are, are embedded in academic publishing. So what we are doing is giving um, African early career researchers a fighting chance, bearing in mind some of the trends in higher education in Africa include that university students, uh, early career researchers must publish before they, they graduate. So now we are giving them a plane where they can you can start seeing their work way bef before, before they actually have that work uh, sub accepted within journals. And also the fact that we are involved with various capacity building partners it's also guiding these same African researchers on the right places to publish. So increasing the research visibility and output coming out of the continent. So we are heavily embedded in this whole process. So um, 
one of the main, we have 10 open access principles. And the main one that we work with, that is number one, is academic research and knowledge from the continent should be freely available to those who wish to access it and to use and reuse it. So, and also at the same time, protect uh, protect our data from misuse and misappropriation. So as much as we are sharing that data, we want to make it visible. We also want to protect our data because that has also been a big problem when we are looking at collaborations. So as much as we are building equity, it's also protecting the data that is originally coming from the continent. And when somebody is at the end of the day is going to cite data coming from from us it will be clearly it will clearly state that yes it did come from the continent even if it was raw data that was taken to the global north and synthesized so before that used to be the challenge you'd you'd have these collaborations and the data goes abroad and you do not have access to it so now there is a platform where all raw data can be put in so this also gives us a fighting chance especially when we are seeking strategic collaborations in the global north so just going in line with what Humbata was saying, language is such an issue for the continent. You're looking at over 6,000 languages in this continent. And so this is narrowed down to the African Union languages out of, to manage all the 54 countries in the, in the region. So you're looking at Arabic in the Northern region and Francophone Africa. And you're also looking at Lusophone Africa for the Portuguese speaking uh, language. And uh, uh, we're also looking at Swahili for Eastern Africa. So other than the fact that we are, we are, we are trying to diversify and accept as many languages as possible, we are not only looking at the African Union languages but we're also looking at languages in countries that are also the business language. So for example, for example, if you're looking at Rwanda, Kenya Rwanda, because this is the business and official language, or Igbo in, in Nigeria, or Amharic in, um, in Ethiopia, or Africans in South Africa, we cannot ignore that as well. So the, the need for diversity in language, especially when it comes to science, is extremely important because we cannot continue saying that English is the language of science because a lot keeps on being dropped because of other, uh, because of the lack of diversity in access to other um, languages. So, with that, we've also partnered with the Masakane NLP. The, the Masakane NLP is a natural language uh, processing uh, uh, um, tech group that are helping in tech community rather that are helping in translating local languages especially research that has been done in local language so that it is easy it is much more accessible to the global community so this is extremely important and with that you are going to end up seeing more research output coming out of the continent so with africa archive and also with uh, tcc africa what you're trying to do is promote the use of local african languages in science because that's happening i mean that is really happening bridge between language groups and the continent so other than the african union languages as that have been indicated english french portuguese also swahili and also the local languages we want to bridge this not only within the continent but also globally and also at the same time highlight the relevance of indigenous traditional knowledge in a research context. Especially for those, the research that comes out of the continent that is social science and arts and humanities based, it is always in the local languages. So sharing this knowledge is extremely important, especially when we are seeking collaborations with the global north. So um, what we've successfully done, as, even though we are, as we are building equity on preprints and the power of preprints in the continent is that we turned challenges into opportunities. So we are looking at 2020 uh, as um, apocalyptic as it seemed. Eh? Um, we were able to create a partnership with the stakeholders you're seeing on the on the left. And what we did is in partnership with all of them, we're able to come up with a call to action to COVID-19 rapid peer review. This was extremely important because there was quite a bit that was slipping through the cracks, especially from research that is coming out of the continent. So it was, we were looking, we were seeing a situation where we we're seeing research that was biased, that was coming only from the, uh, the bulk of it was coming from the global north. So for us to come in as partners, we were able to actually share all the out that is also coming out of the continent, whether there were, whether there were um, abstracts or even preprints that had been, was submitted within the, 
the platform. But the most exciting thing that came out of the this apocalyptic mess that 2020 has been was that um, we encouraged researchers, African researchers, to submit audiovisual uh, abstracts into Africa Archive. And we, with the great collaboration with Papa, we are able to index that. So we, we are looking at a situation whereby within um, Papa, uh, within Africa Archive, we not only have a diversity of language uh, uh, um, submissions, but also we have audiovisual submissions, even in local languages on COVID-19. So this has been a big plus for us. So we had, uh, we had people just submitting uh, videos out of their phones. It didn't have to be very professional, but as long as we could get the whole concept of the of the of this of the of the paper and what they are working on, and this has been very successful, and the submissions are still increasing because now we are giving a chance to those who did not have the opportunity to even finalize to to complete uh, to finalize their writing process, but to share what they're actually doing, even using the audiovisuals, and this gives a a strong point, especially for those in the social sciences, because they tend to use a lot of audiovisuals for for collecting their data, for even presenting uh, the information that they have. So this is such a, an exciting moment for for us, especially with this partnership with Papa. So despite all the challenges that we've been seeing, what we we what we've been endeavor, endeavoring to do is a lot increase our capacity building and mentoring. Uh, or mentorship rather in the continent. So this is through training, especially researchers, research institutes, also guiding governments. And this has been done through strategic collaborations. Like when we had our, uh, our, our major collaboration with the, with the coalition of uh, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, pre-review when it comes to mentorship and also IDA Africa and also access to perspectives um, with TCC Africa, which I manage is, guiding research institutions and governments, especially ministries of education on the importance of, of using, uh, of taking advantage of a, a preprint repository like Africa Archive in storing data that is coming out and research output that is coming out of the respective countries. And at the same time, increasing the research visibility coming out of, uh, out of the respective countries. So basically is making them understand the power of open science with the platform that we, we have uh, availed within the continent, which is Africa Archive. Now, what are our next steps? Um, as I said, 54 countries, as you can see in the continent, 54 countries, extremely diverse, um, but we have learned, we are learning from the mistakes that we are seeing already that exist. Number one, we want, even though we are, we are cognizant of the fact that connectivity is a challenge in the continent. We want to invest in low connectivity and eco-friendly online infrastructure, thus lowering digital carbon footprint. So we're already seeing some of these challenges that already exist in the global north. So as we are investing in the, in the connectivity and partnering with various collaborators in the continent, we are looking at eco-friendly online infrastructure. Uh, we are looking at fostering platform interoperability and multilingualism for peer review tools and services. And the most important bit, as I said, as much as right now you're seeing that Africa Archive has, the bulk of us are Africans who are managing it from various parts of the continent. Literally, we, are, we have people from West Africa, Eastern Africa, I'm from Kenya, that is Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. We are, we are envisioning a decentralized, um, we are, uh, Africa Archive being decentralized, whereby it is Africa managed and Africa owned per region, such as there'll be Africa Archive for Eastern Africa, Africa Archive for Western Africa, Africa Archive for Southern Africa, and also Africa Archive for Northern Africa. So when you're able to decentralize it, it means that we have partners on the ground who are making sure that research output from those regions are going in through Africa Archive does also increasing further visibility of the output that is coming out of the continent. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Joy, for saying all the important work that Africa Archive is doing. It's great to thank hear you. it. Yeah. Okay, so I saw the notice about the last 10 minutes, so it looks like we are running a bit tight on time. 
Um, if you have questions, share them on the Slack anyway, and I'm sure we can continue the conversation there even after this session is over. But um, up now, uh, Jeroen Bosman, over to you. Yes, thank you, Irachan. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be uh, be brief uh, um, in, in order to have some uh, some discussion uh, uh, afterwards. Um, so I will talk a little bit on uh, preprint discoverability, and probably you are familiar with uh, with this uh, with its uh, graphic from uh, uh, from Neil Ferguson and um, and Bianca Kramer on uh, COVID preprints. Um, what you can see here that there is quite a diversity in in preprint archives. Uh, that have uh, preprints dealing with uh, with COVID nineteen, um, but what is interesting is that if you if you look at um, at newspapers, so um, what what archives are mentioned when preprints are mentioned in articles on COVID nineteen? So it, it's good that that increasingly preprints are mentioned and are uh, apparently seen and 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 read by journalists. Um, but if you look at those uh, at those articles in newspapers and other news sources, then you'll see that there is a great bias towards some uh, some archives. So in this case, um, it there's a, a great bias towards the bigger ones, some of the bigger ones, uh, meta archive and bio archive, and there's relatively little attention at, at least mentioning of all those smaller archives that do also have um, have preprints on COVID-19. And, and, and that started me wondering why that is. Uh, earlier this year, I already did, did quite some research into um, um, uh, all kinds of, uh, of preprint archives. So all of these, there's a great, great variety there. In, in, in terms of where they come from and, and, and what disciplines they focus on, et cetera. So what I did is um, uh, I, I just started checking all these archives in various search engines. Um, we do have this live, and I got to be honest with you, I, I hope to, uh, 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 to be able to, uh, to do a full update. So we, we, we did a full check in May of this year. Uh, during during the first uh, first Corona wave here in uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, I hope to do uh, a, a, a full update, but I haven't finished that yet. Uh, but I did some of that, and so this this is live uh, live information that is that is being uh, being updated uh, uh, during this uh, this week and the coming weeks. Um, so what we found in uh, in May of this year that. It is that if you look at search engines that that cover preprints, uh, some of them don't cover preprints at all. So some of the the bigger propriety, uh, expensive ones like Web of Science and Scopus, they don't cover preprints as, at all. And you might say that's not that's not a problem uh, because well, most of the people don't have access to the to these expensive systems anyway. But still, for all of uh, for all of the people that do have access there. Um, they don't come across preprint information, and that that includes many thousands of students, and 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 that that is a bad thing. So I, I, I still hope that at, in, in, at some point they will they will also start including preprints. But if you look at systems that do include preprints, you will find that there is really um, uh, 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 quite a lot of uh, coverage. Um, but it, but there are big differences. So uh, between eleven and some fifty-three archives are uh, were covered in in May twenty twenty. But what is more interesting, if you look at uh, how many are, uh, preprints from those archives are covered in these systems, then you will see big big differences. So, um, for instance, from the twenty-eight uh, preprint archives that are covered in some way in Google Scholar, only four um, were archives to, to such an extent that they covered over 80% of the preprints in that archive. Um, and actually only Lens and OSF were doing quite well in, in, that, in that regard. So they didn't only archive some of the preprints in, in many archives, but actually almost all of them. 
Um, and um, that, that was re really a big problem in, in Google Scholar, but also in, in Dimensions, the, the, the product from Digital Science, and also in Science Open, a smaller uh, uh, search engine for, for open science material. Um, luckily, um, the first one that I started checking to, uh, to do for, for this update this, uh, this, uh, this December was Dimension because I heard that from them that they uh, start, started increasing their coverage and really they did and I have to, uh, to applaud the way they did that. Um, so right now they uh, cover a lot more preprinted pre archives and almost all of them uh, are really covered uh, almost completely. Um, so, so that is good news. I don't know yet uh, the situation for the other ones, but I expect that for many of them, uh, sort of, um, it will be a positive story um, for two reasons. First of all, because of COVID, uh, preprints got sort of more or less accepted uh, by mainstream scientists, um, but also by, by these companies uh, that, that have these search engines. Um, so they don't uh, don't any longer sort of select by archive, but they just get the data from Crossref. So all preprint archives that that have DOIs either from Crossref or data site, they probably will be covered. And then it's just a matter of how fast will preprints be added to the to those search engines? Because of course you don't want to lose uh, a, a few weeks or, or or more than a month in uh, with uh, access to 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 new uh, preprints. So I guess that that the technical problem of indexing will sort of be solved. What is a bigger problem, and I will also uh, uh, start looking into that, is. Um, whether there are any uh, differences in other ways of discoverability and findability of, uh, of preprints. And that is more because of their, for instance, their linking. Uh, are they well linked from journal websites? But also because of their, uh, because of their standing. Um, for instance, if, if journals work with preprint archives to make uh, submission of preprints very easy for that journal. They pick out the main ones first. If you if you go to PLOS, you see that they have very easy arrangement with MetaArchive and with BioArchive, but not with the 45 other preprint archives. So it's it's always the main ones, and quite often those those in in life sciences that are treated the first and 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 the best. And I think that will become more of a problem. So it, it will be more are all these preprint archives also when they are small, also when they are uh, not, um, uh, not let or, or uh, owned by, uh, by publishers. So if they are independent, are they treated in the same way as, as, those, uh, as those bigger ones? And that, that is, I think, a probably a more important question to look into. What can we do for those independent academic led uh, preprint archives. For instance, can we make sure that they, if, if we if we want to have an, an academic-led open infrastructure, that they very well tie into publishing in non-APC open access journals. So having uh, independent preprint archives really tie up with uh, with Diamond journals and, and and publishers from from Diamond journals to make that a, a very easy uh, easy workflow as an alternative to. Uh, um, to proprietary uh, uh, solutions. And I'll, I'll leave it with that for the sake of, uh, uh, of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jiren. It, this resonates with me quite a bit because I, I, I quite believe in the quote of if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So it's important to get the sense of uh, how essentially it was the level of adoption and that we have visibility around that. I believe I saw a note saying that we have a couple of minutes. So I'm just going to double check with Jessica whether there are any existing questions. Uh, I don't see any questions in the Slack reply, but I haven't checked all the different channels. Um, please do feel free to. So maybe I'll yeah. take the prerogative of the chair and ask something briefly to all of the panelists. Hopefully we can fit it in before the final warning of Zoom. Um, very briefly, if you were to give one tip to any of us here or even beyond anyone working in science as to what is the one tangible thing that each of us could do to bring more equity in terms of the preprints usage and engagement with preprints, what would it be? Uh, maybe Umberto, do you want to go first? 
Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, that was a very difficult one. But the first thing that I thought about was uh, to keep. Uh, a key thing is it's, it's about access in terms of uh, the economical aspects of access. So uh, if if preprint servers are co-opted by profit or the editorial industry, one of the very few, one of the many aspects that are really value about them may may start to generate a new barrier or access of. The, I mean, in terms of readership or access to posts, etc. It's like I, 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 when I discovered preprints, I was so happy that they were free to read and free to publish. I was like surprised. So, so if and 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 I think that we eventually reach like an status quo, and I'm always afraid that that could change in terms of sustainability. So, to keep that status in this case, that would be great for me. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have actually two, sorry. One is sustainability and language diversity. So if you're looking at if you're looking at bringing equity, let's not ignore the diversity that comes with with the, the language from the regions that are contributing uh, to to the global knowledge itself. So we need to invest in language diversity. That is number one. And also we need to look at how, how we can sustain um, preprint services and uh, not necessarily looking at the big ones, but all even the independent ones, how can academic publishers work closely with these preprint services so that they can be sustainable? Because at the end of the day, it is the academic publisher who is going to benefit from the output that is coming out of the preprint service. Yeah. Thank you so much. Jaren, what, what would be your advice? My advice would be probably also looking at my own profession. My, my, my advice would be to raise awareness about changes in publication culture among the new generation. So with students that are currently doing their bachelor's or master's or, or working on their PhD, to really tell them about uh, about preprints, about what they change and what, what kind of culture, what kind of uh, uh, engagement with with content they uh, they expect from people, um, and and for that I think it, it would be great if we could sort of convince the tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of my immediate colleagues, so librarians that have information literacy classes all over the globe, telling students what good. Uh, research is what good publications are and they might still be not fully convinced or might be a little bit uh, afraid to to fully accept preprints and and perhaps also not not really know how to how to deal with them so that would be my uh, my tip Libri librarians are always a good resource I, I tend to be a great fan of them <laughs> the more I know about them Right, I see the final notice about the breakout rooms before we get out of here. I just wanted to thank all of our speakers. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and perspective with us. It's been fantastic. Thank you to all of the attendees uh, for the patience with Zoom and for, for listening to all of, of this information. Again, feel free to continue the conversation on Slack if you have questions that you didn't get to post. We will be happy to, again, keep uh, talking with you about this topic. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you soon.